So finally we have uh, reached the point where we are ready to discuss Einstein's equation. Well, not all the things we discussed are going to be used, but eventually to solve Einstein's equation and to have an understanding of that, uh, we needed some background and that's why I discussed all those in the previous lectures. Now there's a rich history how Einstein arrived to his famous equations and um, there is uh, an article in on the internet which is general covariance and foundation of general relativity which you can google and if you are interested you can read the history but the basic idea was that um, before Einstein Newton's law was something that defined how gravity acts so this is a Poisson equation which defines how the gravitational potential depends on the density here, mass density. Now uh, because uh, things like curvature came in practice and curvature um, and things like, um, well actually it was um, Einstein's friend Grossman who introduced him to the mathematics mathematics of Ricci and Levi Civita and um, Einstein actually had previously re has already realized that the new theory of gravity, sh gravity should be a tensor theory. It cannot be a scalar theory like Newton's equation here. So this equation needed to be extended or actually um, the counterpart for um, the, I mean the, the basic idea is that gravity should be expressed in tensors. Now um, is the metric that defines the space-time curvature and here the second order derivative is involved. So in a hand waving way you can say that actually the um, left hand side when we do this extension should be the second derivative of the metric. Um, so um, and inspired by all this actually Einstein proposed this equation. Now in the previous class we already have discussed that a uh, four dimensional extension uh, of density, just mass density, is stress energy tensor. So instead of using density for Newtonian mechanics or Newtonian potential, is the stress energy tensor that is now the source term. Here you see is the rho, which is the source term which produces potential phi. But in this case, it's the T mu nu or stress energy tensor is the source term that is going to produce R mu nu which is the Ricci tensor or which depends on the curvature of space time. So Einstein first of all actually Einstein posed many things because it was a long time many many years passed but this was something which was very close to his final equations and uh, it actually did um, uh, solve uh, some of the problems but it, it this equation itself had its own problem and the problem is that we know that the stress energy trend is conserved uh, that's a different topic. I, I will revisit. About, I already have talked about stress energy tender, tensor. It's not very satisfactory. Um, so, uh, so I'll uh, revisit stress energy tensor and talk more how all these things come. But right now, let's just accept this that the stress energy tensor is conserved. But you see, if this is true, it's not going to be true for Ricci scalar. So Ricci scale, uh, sorry Ricci tensor. Ricci tensor is not going to satisfy the same condition, and if it's not going to satisfy the same condition, you, this equation is not going to satisfy for all situations. As a matter of fact, in when matter is present, this is not satisfied. So there's a problem with this um, equation, and Einstein actually proposed a new equation, which was um, G mu nu equals 8 pi g c to the power 4 t mu nu. Now sometimes I put indices up, sometimes I put down, it's not a problem right now. 
it's just a different way of expressing uh, tensor covariantly com in, in, in terms of covariant components or in terms of contravariant components. It's not going to change the physics of the problem. Okay, so uh, unless the equation is consistent, so equation needs to be consistent. So if these are mu nu lower, then this should be mu nu uh, lower here also. Okay, where g mu nu is called, well, this is Einstein's equation. This is called Einstein's equation. And G mu nu is called Einstein tensor, and it's given as R mu nu minus half. Now you know mu nu is can be between zero to three. R is the Ricci scalar. G mu nu. This is Einstein tensor. So um, that's about it actually. That's Einstein's equation. It has been valid. I mean, so far none of the experiments have invalidated this equation. There, there has been no no experiment that have shown that this equation is violated. So this is Einstein's equation, and we know that um, we can talk about special cases. For example, we know that um, the low velocity limit of special relativity is nothing but Galilean transformation. But low velocity and low um, field or weak field, you can say, velocity and weak field limit of GR actually results in Newtonian. Um, Newtonian theory of gravity. We can actually show that uh, that give from this equation. So um, we can show that by um, considering that the velocity involved are low. Moreover, um, the the field itself is uh, weak. So we know that the geodesic equation. Well, all I have to show, show that the geodesic equation uh, will reduce to Newton's law if the field is weak and the velocity is low. So the geodesic equation for a, a, a general, general relative, a general, general, a general, general relativistic geodesic will reduce to uh, Newton's law. So we know geodesic is given as d square x mu over d lambda square. Mu alpha beta dx alpha d lambda dx beta d lambda equals zero. Now you know that lambda is nothing but something that is parameter parameterizing the path uh, of the geodesic. Uh, the thing is that if the particle is moving, we can always choose d tau or the proper time. That is parameterizing the path. For example, if a particle is moving on this trajectory, we know is the proper time that can be used to parameterize this path uh, on, or the geodesic on which it is moving. So we can actually write d square x mu over d tau square plus mu alpha beta dx alpha d lambda d. Uh, not d lambda, but d tau and dx beta d tau equals 0. Now, if it is a low velocity case, we know that we can change d tau to dt and simply write d square x mu dt square plus equals 0. Now, um, we know it is a weak k field case, so we can always write uh, g mu nu equals eta mu nu plus h mu nu, where h is very small, 
and that gives us g mu nu equals eta mu nu minus h mu nu sorry eta mu nu well you know eta is nothing but the Minkowski matrix minus 1 1 1 1 or depending how you choose your basis can be 1 1 1 minus 1 so it's minus 1 1 1 1 uh, this is minus 1 1 1 1 <coughs> and this is I think uh, 1 1 1 minus 1 um, minus h mu nu now h mu nu is very small um, compared to you can say 1 because you see the, the diagonal terms are 1 in eta so h the terms written the terms written in h are much smaller than 1 because eta is composed of 1s and minus 1s okay if this is the approximation you can actually see that the only thing the only equations that actually survive are these now I'm writing I because I goes from 1 to 3 all the equation can be ignored because h is small uh, it's because of diagonal terms you see here in g mu nu are very small okay and um, also we know that because x is a four dimensional vector this is nothing but speed of light because we know that hmm, this is nothing but c x y z is the vector x well I'm using x to in two different places so let's call this capital X capital Y and cap just the coordinate x y z okay and that gives us d square x i over d t square equals c square over 2 del h 0 0 divided by now I have so it looks like I have skip some of the steps and that gives me h 0 0 this is a standard textbook problem now if you write your g 0 0 like this no one is stopping us from doing that um, we can see well let's leave it here for now this is equation 1 and also from Einstein's equation we haven't used Einstein's equation we know that because we need to simplify this further because Einstein's equation is something that defines that gives you the metric so let's find out g is 0 0 using metric uh, using Einstein's equation minus half g alpha beta r equals k t alpha beta call it mu nu alpha beta is the same thing um, uh, well in the Newtonian limit we know it's the only energy density part of the T alpha beta that is going to contribute so we can simply write this as R 0 0 equals half K rho C square and we know that R 0 0 is nothing but del mu 0 0 over del X mu minus del mu 0 mu over del x 0 again taking the weak field limit we can say that r 0 0 equals where we know we have uh, not um, we are, this i actually just goes from 1 2 and 3 now we can if you rewrite it exp, exp, solve it further we'll get ij del square h 0 0 del x i del x i equals half k rho c squared and that actually gives me um, let me make a box here that gives me del square if you compare it with 1 
if we compare this this thing with one, we get del square phi equals half k rho c four. Um, okay, and we know we can see that k is nothing but eight pi g c over four, and that gives me nebula square phi equals four pi g rho. So phi, uh, which is nothing, but gives uh, once you have the phi, you can also find g is zero zero, and you have your metric. Actually, this is the only element surviving in metric. Uh, now this looks like a force. Basically, uh, the metric is in such a way that the geodesic just depends on one scalar field phi, and uh, this phi sort of satisfies this condition. So you can say that. Ma mass has curved space time and the particle is following space time or the other way in which Newton saw it was that there is a potential phi that is actually being produced by this mass density rho which makes which uh, makes the particle move and in that in that interpretation gravity is a force and that's what I actually Einstein gave a new insight that gravity is not a force but it's an act of falling you know I didn't really do a very great job here doing this uh, math in here. Uh, but it's a standard textbook problem. The basic idea was to show that um, in the weak field and weak and low velocity limit, Einstein's equation actually uh, uh, result in uh, Newton's equation. Uh, in the following class, actually, I will uh, prove uh, or derive. Actually